Hi, flower lovers. Today, Ro and I are going to be talking about some good friends of ours, the Artemisia family. Um, and these are plants that are commonly called mugworts, um, sometimes sagebrush. It's a pretty diverse family that's been used for a really long time in herbal medicine, uh, both Western and Eastern. And we like to explore the possibilities of all the different essences that are made from these plants and what sorts of healing gifts they bring. Um, we are recording today on a moon day, which is perfect for talking about the goddess Artemis. Hey, Ro. Hello. So happy to be talking about this um, genus of plants. Yeah, it's been part of the preparation that I've been doing um, with Ruth Toledo Alt Schuler when we're doing our botanical families in flower essence therapy. And we've been talking about um, the aster family, the Asteraceae, um, and mugworts are Artemisias are one of these Asteraceae plants. Asteraceae is a gigantic family, something like 25,000 species. Uh, and one of its little um, family members um, is the Artemisia. So you might know the Asteraceae as being like sunflowers and Echinacea. Um, it's, it's a pretty broad family. Um, and even though Artemisia does not have a wildly showy flower, like, <laughs> like something like a sunflower, um, it is still in the same family. So we thought we'd really specialize on this today and go deep into the topic because I know that it is one of your favorite plants. Yeah, I've always had this attraction to mugwort. I'm not sure when it started or why. I think just ever since first hearing the name mugwort, something about it sort of grabbed me before I even ever met the plant. And then I started working with it more um, doing when I when I was in a shamanic um, plant spirit apprenticeship program, I think back in 2016. And we did a weekend um, communing with mugwort and it's various, you know, California mugwort, European mugwort. So they're very similar. In fact, mugwort, I believe there's mugwort on every continent. It's native to every continent on the planet. So there are uh, so many um, species of it and it's every everywhere that there's sort of ancient myths or legends, there's some sort of mugwort um you know, myth in there or or something that speaks to how long it's been around and how much it's been revered herbally and magically. So it's just it just sparks the imagination. And it's really known for, you know, having an affinity with the the wise old crone, the crone woman who has um I see that plant spirit as one that is just kind of, uh, you know, like the the crone that will give you hints about something and kind of laugh if you don't get it. So it's not this warm and fuzzy, helpful energy, so to speak. It's more like going to, you know, help you along your path and push you to your edges and help you get into the sacred space to the point where you can find the the magic within yourself instead of getting a, you know a handout from from a plant so to speak <laughs> that's where, where i how i see the mugwort how about you well that certainly fits in with the um, connection with Diana or um, also Artemis um, is the same name for the goddess um, who was a hunter. You know, she was a badass. You know, <laughs> she was um, in the, in the mythology, she's a, a Greek uh, mythological character. Um, she was the goddess of the hunt, the wilderness um, of nature um, and also oddly chastity. And when I was looking up the myth a little bit more, I got a little bit more information on that because in that era, the, the, that aspect of chastity was as much as anything like she refused to marry and be subject to you know, a man and be like a secondary. She's like, nope, we're not going to do that. I'm going to be doing my own thing over here. Um, so she has that strong feminine quality, um, which there is something about mugwort and all of these different mugworts from all around the world that it it draws women. You know, it it we we connect with this plant on a deep, a deep foundational level. Absolutely. And 
the uh, one thing that I found out about mugwort is it's considered one of the oldest plants in in mythology and in northern the northern tradition mythology. So um, there's a book I have called The Northern Shamanic Herbal by Raven Caldera, and he talks about these um, the Song of the Nine Sacred Herbs, which is is uh, writings from the 10th century or earlier. And it has, it's basically a poem that, ha that talks about these nine herbs in old English. So it's been translated. And the first one in the poem is mugwort. And the, so I'll just read the, that one paragraph and it says, keep in mind mugwort, what you made known, what you laid down at the great denouncing Una, your name is, oldest of herbs, of might against three and against thirty, of might against venom and the on-flying, of might against the vile foe who fares through the land. I mean, there's certainly, it's not a sweet pea kind of an herb, right? It's it's a powerful herb. It's it's not inconsequential and and fluttery. Um, so that that what an interesting, I don't know as much about the herbal uses as you do. I know that you're very familiar with that. Um, but I, I'll just start by describing the plant a little bit because that might be useful if if someone listening maybe has never really encountered it. Although once you maybe look it up and start to look at some of the images, you'll realize, oh, it's all over the place, <laughs> um, you know, wherever you go. But the m many of the mugworts have a very silvery quality to the leaf. They have they tend to have something, a little bit of a fuzzy coating to the leaves. They grow in all different kinds of places. Um, they grow in kind of rough territories. They're not really picky about the, about where they grow. They can tolerate heat and exposure and all that. Um, the, the leaves tend to have a strongly um, a fragrant, like a pungent quality to them when you would crush them, uh, which is going to be an advantage um, growing in the wild where, you know, rabbits and deer and whatnot don't t tend to um, eat them. Uh, also, one other odd little thing is they have little tiny flowers and they're wind pollinated. So they have a connection to the air element, um, which is quite interesting. One other little piece that I wanted to bring in about the plant um, is, is that they are a butterfly habitat plant. Um, and in my garden, I'm growing an Artemisia, um, a Japanese species of Artemisia, no, sorry, Chinese species of Artemisia. Um, and this spring I was watching little birds taking the leaves, the, the soft leaves and lining their nests with them. That's going to be a really nice fragrant smelling nest. That's pretty awesome to have seen that. And they are, the leaves are so soft and the smell is so strong. It's an inter interesting juxtaposition there with uh, these artemisias and i'm growing artemisia vulgaris that's the european mugwort and artemisia um the glossii which is the california mugwort and also the california sagebrush which is artemisia californica and another one which i'm not sure exactly what it is but it's an asian mugwort and they all have the most fantastic smell i really it's to really get mugwort, I think you have to smell it somehow. And since it grows on every continent on the planet, I mean, it, it shouldn't be that hard to find. And it's very easy to grow. So, you know, we, we want to do, we do want to talk about the energetic uses and flower essence uses, but, you know, I, I'm so excited to, to just talk about the plant and the, the, the scent it has. It really is unique and powerful and it has this ability to bring on a slightly altered state not you know like a hallucinogen but it just it's just that little slightly alter altering of of your consciousness where all of a sudden things kind of seem a little bit different you know the you might see colors in a different way and that sense sensory smell uh, smell of it um it, it shifts something. And that's the first way to really meet that plant is to get that, that smell. And I, I just hope that everyone listening who hasn't met mugwort will go try to find some mugwort and get that, an idea of that. One of the um, interpretations of this 
state that you're referring to is it's like a dream state. It's it brings on this sort of softened consciousness that is like more numinous and more dreamlike and somehow less linear than the solar world. You know, we're talking, we're going into the lunar realm. Yeah. And that uh, brings up a good point. M- you know, mugwort is known, if anyone's heard of mugwort, they've generally heard of it as an herb to bring dreams or to have a, a mugwort um, herb pillow that you put um, under your pillow and, at night for dreams. But I do want to clarify that it's not necessarily peaceful. It's not necessarily in this nice, peaceful sleep. In fact, I've heard from more than a couple people who can't even have it in their bedroom because their dreams were too intense. So that goes to its its real its use of prophecy and divination and having prophetic dreams. So that's something to have fun experimenting with if if it's something that you want to see if mugwort can help with that. But also know that if you need a good night's sleep, maybe maybe it's not the night to put mugwort under your pillow. That is and such a other... useful distinction for people yeah. to know because, you know, like some things are just like happy sleepy time, you know, maybe a little lavender or whatever. This is more intense dreaming. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I I mean, I heard from someone who uh, couldn't even have it in the bedroom. Like they had to, they like in the middle of the night, they got up and threw it out of the bedroom because they wanted to get some sleep. So, you know, that's a a funny story to to think about. Um, I haven't had that experience with it, but you never know. I think there is a polarizing aspect to mugwort um, that some people really love it and some people are kind of on the other side of the fence. Um, and I, I've, I've, I've been a little more familiar with it through um, like the FES makes an oil, an infused oil called mugwort moon magic. Um, and some people who liked love that oil, love it, but it, it does, it can take them a little too far outside of their, um, outside of their logic centers. Um, and so it's not always, it's it's good in certain circumstances, but maybe not a daily use kind of a thing. Yeah. It's the, the main action of that herbal oil and that, and the herbal use, it's really, it has an affinity for um, the, the female system and it can really help pull on the menses. And I, you know, I've had that experience very profoundly and, but the overall energetic action is just, it's moving energy. It's pulling energy. It's used for, you can, you know, use topically for bruises because it moves the, the, the blood, it moves, it's circulatory and it moves that, um, that, that energy and that blood. And so anything that's stuck or stagnant, that's where you would apply it and topically as an oil. And I make the oil as well and use it exactly for that on the places of the body where energy feels to get stuck and stagnant. And it's also very um, cleansing to the body. So there's also an affinity with, with the liver for getting things moving as well. But that topical use with the mugwort, with the mugwort moon magic, you know, I believe it's for rubbing on the abdomen and, and getting things going that way. And so you can, you know, I had an experience when I worked at the herb shop explaining mugwort's uses to someone and talking, just talking about it and talking about its action for just this pulling of energy downward through the system. And as I was talking about it, I started my period. (laughs) So it was uh, pretty intense. It was really pretty funny to, um, to have that experience because mugwort was coming in and just validating what I was saying in this completely physical way. That was so funny. (laughs) Hello, Moon. <laughs> yeah. Wow, amazing. Um, and it, but it, isn't that interesting? That does bridge this idea of you know we were talking about it in its physical state, in its herbal state. Um, and I loved how you were saying that you know it moves energy because I because just before that I was like it moves chi. You know, <laughs> so it's same same thing, different language. Um, that's what it does. It, it warms and it moves chi. Um, but that whole quality of even 
even talking about it could bring its action into your experience. Um, and isn't that a lot like how essences work, where they are bringing this vibrational quality, you've, you've, you've brought it into the room. And so having an essence of this plant isn't going to give you the same physical effects, but it can, it's something interrelated. How, how would you, how do you start to look at these different between maybe using it as an oil and, or also using essences with this, with this plant? Yeah. Well, using it as an oil, like I said, that that moving that energy stuck energy in the body so great for massaging into the body on those specific places and before getting into essences just want to mention burning mugwort uh, is one of the traditional ways of using it and so burning herbs is is in all of the traditions around the world you know the for um, clearing and purifying spaces and mugwort, especially if you have European ancestry, um, it's a great alternative to say the smudging with, um, American sage, which is a native American practice. You can do the same thing with many other herbs for clearing spaces. And mugwort is a traditional one for from various European traditions. Um, it's called saining um, in, in Irish, and there's another word for it in the northern um, shamanic tradition. And the way that it works in that purification process, it's not just purification of the space, it's a sanctification of the space. And that's a differentiation that again, Raven Caldera makes in, in his description of mugwort. So making a real sacred space, it, it and so bringing that around to how it affects our, our energy internally and how I, I look also using the flower essence is is connecting with your own sacred space and connecting with your own magic, the magic within you. You know, talking about burning mugwort, um, you know, it was certainly bringing to mind the use in Chinese medicine uh, of moxa, which is a preparation of dried um, certain herbs and mostly artemisia, mug mugwort, um, for the most part. There are many different possibilities, but the basic one is mugwort um, and using moxa for, um, you know, once again, you're using it to move chi. So you can be using it on sore muscles, um, on um, injuries to get the, get the chi flowing. Anything with the skin is intact, of course. Um, but it's also used um, more specifically and more fine pointed to kind of tonify, to sort of build up the energy of the body while having it move appropriately. So it's something that is in a, a, a very important part of of Chinese medicine um, and is used widely um, for that purpose. So it's really interesting how different cultures have developed these uses. Um, and it is also used to clear. So there you go. <laughs> Clearing spaces um, almost in this much kind of a fashion. Yeah. And it doesn't surprise me for a plant that has been around and used in traditional herbal medicine for so long it just has such a rich history that it, the fact that it's on all the the continents um and we have these similar uses from all of these traditions which is is wonderful and it just i think reinforces that you know that ethnobotanical use really reinforces the i think the energy work that these plants do Agreed. And it is, it's so interesting as we're sitting and talking and, and bringing mugwort and, and the Artemisias into the room. I mean, I'm just feeling less focused and more, <laughs> and more expansive as we're talking. So trying to keep it all straight, but I would love to talk about um, some of these as essences and from the different companies. I, I'm a little bit familiar with the Flower Essence Society's mugwort, which is, I believe, the Artemisia douglasii. Um, the, it's a California native, and they have that as one of the essences in their dream kit. Um, and so it is very much about this sort of liminal space between dreaming and sleeping and, and helping to um, improve, emphasize, um, harmonize our ability to come back and forth between these dreaming waking states and 
you know, one of the things they talk about is this quality of, of, of soul development in the dream state, you know, where if you're just in your, you know, normal daily solar life, you know, where you just interact with the world in the normal way, um, but then you're missing out on this all the other side of your life by sort of wasting that dream space. But that, I think that's where some of the mugwort indications are coming in for that particular essence. Are there any similarities with some of the essences that you've made? Or I, I can talk about some of the artemisias, but um, or the wormwoods. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I don't, you know, and I don't use the essences I've made that often. I use the European mugwort more, and that is for people really wanting to get in touch with their um their sacred side their magic side their crone side um and now and especially now going through any kind of transitional time in their life and wanting to get that sacred feminine strength that divine feminine strength through their transition so it's just definitely a, a feminine strength herb and one that helps realize your own magic so if you're not feeling it you can't connect with it um you want to work with it more that's one place i would use the european mugwort um flower essence and i work with it more topically creating an infused oil as well as the, using the California mugwort. And those, to me, they're bringing some of that ritual energy into self-care. So I think, and that could probably cross over with the FES mugwort moon magic. So it's not just about, you know, applying a cream on your skin. It's a, making it sort of a ritual, making it sacred as you're doing it um infusing and you know you could do that by putting the flower essence into a cream as well if you don't have the infused oil uh although you won't get that scent that the infused oil um carries with it as well but i use it regularly on uh, the back of my neck where energy tends to get stuck and it helps flow that energy down through the body and i use it on my lower back where energy tends to get stuck and that's just helping it move down through the body and out so that it's not getting stagnant. I don't remember your question. <laughs> I don't know Once if again, I we are it. getting to these drifty so realms. I've got, um, yeah, exactly. I've got but a whole it is, bunch of mugwort on oh, my uh, yeah. desk right here and I'm smelling it and uh, getting into that um, sacred space. Yeah, the the energy has definitely entered the room for sure. I've brought some mugwort into my space also. So we're getting the full mugwort action on both sides. Yeah. Um one of the other applications that you that I was thinking of when you were talking about it of 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 you know putting the oil or anointing your body um with either the essence or an infused oil um you know the indication would be that it's um from from the Chinese medicine angle of, of moxa is these situations would be worse with cold. So it, they're not situations that are worse with heat. They tend to be sort of, um, they need the addition of heat. So, you know, you, it's, it's a type using moxa as a stick, um, you know, in an indirect manner, you are adding heat in a certain way that helps the chi to flow. So that's really interesting that you find it with the oil, that that's another way of doing that. And maybe like an oil and a hot compress might be a really nice way to sort of kind of add and help get that going. And I know people will put it in their bath also, which sounds awesome. In this family, we, you know, we want to talk a little bit about the wormwoods too, which are so similar, but definitely different. Wormwood has a, a bit of a different energy. And of course, it's um, Artemisia absinthium, which is what absinthe was made from. And um, it's, there's, you know, you've probably heard all the stories of people going crazy from drinking it. And there's some controversy over what actually caused that. It could have been the the high or alcohol content that was industrial, the, the knockoffs to the good absinthe was made with industrial alcohol and sometimes heavy metals like copper. And that may have contributed to some of these stories we've heard about Van Gogh and others who um, overdid it with, uh, with 
with absinthe. And it does have a, some toxicity to it, although it it is it's so bitter. You know, it's one of the most bitter plants um, that we have, and it can be used medicinally with in in bitters and bitter formulas for very small amounts of time. Some herbalists disagree about using it internally at all, and and some think it's okay in small amounts for short amounts of time but it again works on cold the cold digestive system as a bitter so the cold liver that's stagnant it just brings that warmth and that movement and action to um to the body herbally and we could also be looking at you know and and kind of trying to shift the focus into the essence use the essence that i've used the most that's called a wormwood and you know these are all part of this spectrum of of mugworts artemisias um the alaskan essences mountain wormwood um this is one that i just always remember jane bell talking about as being all about the worms of discontent you know and and what we're talking about with this using this essence of mountain wormwood is these places in your body or psyche or emotions where you kind of have tightened down around things around these resentments or grudges or experiences that you're just still kind of pissed off about um and that the mountain wormwood kind of gets in there and starts it to move and allows you to come to a new place with it allows you to come to a place of peace with it so it's moving cold stuck energy right you know that it's like that's what it's doing but more archetypally yeah i i think that's interesting i don't know what the species of mountain i don't remember what the species of mountain wormwood is and i don't think i've met that plant but I can see because of its bitter quality, it does work with that bitterness, um, but by warming things up, you know, it's it's always by warming things up. And the other quality I've I've experienced from the 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 Artemisia absinthium wormwood is sort of a um, a real uh, mental there was a real ben mental effect and so this is just working with it working with the plant and and feeling the energy from the plant and getting to know it shamanically you know I had quite an experience it was almost hallucinogenic sitting with the plant and feeling how it would move the energy around me um and put me into a different space completely so I haven't really researched the artemisia absinthium flower essence yet so i've made the essence and i really haven't begun to use it much it hasn't it hasn't appeared to me hasn't given me its information about so much about how much it wants how it wants to be used so i find it really interesting though that alaskan essences um works with mountain wormwood and has that bitterness principle in its uh, in its quality in its energetic um uses it's it's interesting because these really aren't like warm fuzzy essences these are these tend to be you know kind of intense um and for things that you know aren't aren't daily issues in that you know oh i just want some more courage you know so you know maybe i'll be thinking borage or the, you know those sorts of essences where we just you know day, everyday kind of existence these ones are are, you know, shadow stuff, you know, we're talking about lunar aspects, we're talking about, um, you know, where we hold things, um, and how we hold on to things, maybe we shouldn't, um, and, you know, helping us to move them. So it's, these aren't always, you know, ones that you are going to be working with on a daily basis, they're going to be something that you'll be working with situationally. Um, and, you know, getting to know a little bit better over time. And this brings my mind to um, the Artemisia that that I've made um, from the flora of Asia, um, which is um, a type of, of Chinese Artemisia. Um, and my experience of making it and what I've what I've used it for are really when 
when my ego had an idea, my ego had a plan, you know, my, my mind, you know, I don't want to disparage egos. Egos are useful. Um, but you know, whenever I sort of hardened around a plan or this is the way I was planning for it to go. And, and then it doesn't, <laughs> you know, and then it kind of brings out your little two-year-old and you want to throw a temper tantrum and get all pissed off and just like, it didn't go the way I wanted. Um, the Artemisia kind of helps to soften that and helps you to to go with the flow and realize, okay, this is what's happening. And, you know, this is, this is a perfectly acceptable outcome and I can, I can live with this. Um, but we just, you know, it helps to soften that part of ourselves that are just so frustrated that our plans have been thwarted. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I've, I've felt similar um, with that ego being, it's interesting that you say that because I have written that in some of my notes about it, about um, letting go of the ego and also back to um to wormwood and the shadow side i feel like yes both the uh definitely the um the european mugwort and the wormwood are helpful with working with the shadow side and that's why yeah it's not something that is used all the time and has that warm and fuzzy but at the same time you know well with wormwood uh, I'll say, you know, it's also been used traditionally for expelling worms. I mean, that's where it, where it gets its name. And so I always imagine that like the worms of that, you know, some negative thought forms that that are stuck, that are lodged wormwood, I think would be an excellent energetic to to help move that through the system. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's that visual of where you kind of look, you know, experience your insides as sort of like crawling with frustrations and <laughs> crawling with, it doesn't feel like nice, healthy flow. It doesn't feel like healthy emotions. It feels like things are stuck and, and, you know, stagnant and icky. And we just need things to kind of move around a little bit. Can we talk a little bit about the sage brushes? Um, you know, I know that you're familiar with one, um, um, a different species. I'm a little fam familiar. <laughs> I'm a little familiar with the sage brush, sage brush that the, the Flower Essence Society makes, which is Artemisia tridentata. Um, and you know, they describe it as as you know being a transformative agent, um, helping to let go of attachments. You know, once again, we're talking in the realm of the ego, right? All of the things that we are expecting. And so there's so many circumstances where life is changing and, you know, you're, something's going away and something is leaving you. And this is very much a fall season kind of scenario, or just the time that we're in now, things are changing, um, things are going away and we don't know what's happening next, but we like some part of us just like wants to grip on and never let go. And Sagebrush helps us to start to release that attachment and that just like accept that, you know, opening your hands is really the only way to go here and whatever's flowing away from you, you just let it go. Agree with that. And also the California sage rush that I've worked with, it's very similar. And I, the strongest energy I've felt from that is for transition times, transformation, going through personal transformation, going through those um, life stages and letting go of the old to be able to accept the new. And, you know, part of that is that letting go of the ego or being stuck on how things used to be. Um, so important for, uh, you know, especially women and the transformation our bodies go through when we go through puberty and we get our menses, when we get pregnant, when we go through menopause, those are the transformational, the personal and physical and spiritual transformation that I really see the sagebrush being an ally for and and the mugwort as well but definitely the sagebrushes and just to note when we say sagebrush we're not talking about sages so we're not talking about it's different it's in the artemisia family it's not in the sage family like the common garden sage or the white sage or any of that kind of sage this is the peril of common names because <laughs> you're not always recognizing that it's not, it's in a very different family than, than something that's a salvia. So these are Artemisia is not salvia, but I think that one of the common names of sagebrush is it's kind of sort of like chaparral where it's sort of one of those vague, vague terms that has a strongly pungent um, scent. Um, but it is such an important essence really. Um, I know that I was 
working with a, a case kind of recently and and so many people are you know having to sort of their their this in this particular case um the client was was coming to a place with her parents where they were needing more care and they weren't she was almost having to switch into the role of being a parent and her siblings um weren't really stepping up to the role. And there was a, a frustration with that of like, this was changing and she was trying to adapt to it, but it's also really awkward and weird, you know, having to switch into these different roles in life. So it was very much a, a sagebrush moment because just wasn't able to have a parent child relationship like there had been before it had, it had changed and, and, and morphed over this time. And she was having to step more into that parental role. So once again, it's, you know, changing and transformation and, you know, not all transformations feel great. You know, I think this brings it back around to our original concept for this episode, which was the myth and magic of the, the mugworts and the Artemisias. And what is magic? It's, it's transformation. It's, that's exactly what it is. So we don't tend to think of these hard transformations in our life as magic, but if we are working with them consciously, then that's what they are. And that's how we can bring magic into our life. We, we have to work on our own transformation in order to access that. And making your life, you know, a magic project, um, you know, and, and part of that magic is to go with the flow that is life. It's not all about trying to force it. And this is very much where you get into the, you know, lunar versus solar magic. We're talking lunar magic. We're talking working with the forces that are um, working with the energies and the seasons and the timings um, and with that sort of intuitive force of allowing um and also directing but a lot of allowing and that the all of these artemisias help to support that process of of growth transformation in this very organic fashion yeah i think there's a certain part of it that is a surrender a surrendering and the artemisias help us do that that letting go is a, is a form of surrender and that will help bring in the transformation and the magic so everyone please take the opportunity to meet to meet your local friendly neighborhood mugwort <laughs> um, go for a hike or go out and see if you can find one growing and get to know it a little bit um, and if there is you know, if it's growing in your garden, maybe you can bring a little bit in and spend some time with it or spend time with it in situ. Um, or if that's just not possible, you can always get um, some mugwort essences and start to work with them and start to see how you can support your own transformational process and, you know, kind of working the magic of your life with mugwort. And you can also get some moxibustion, moxibustion from your local acupuncturist which yeah. is a wonderful experience as well wonderful well this has been lovely and happy monday happy moon day and we will see you next time